So here we go. We, we're, we're dealing with the Feast of the Lord, and we're, we're into the Day of Atonement and really uh, looking at the high priest. And, uh, and as I continue to look at this and consider this before the Lord, unless something changes in my heart, we'll probably be here for quite a while. I, just the Lord is just really, really dealing with me in our great high priest and the relationship of the priest to the day of atonement, the fulfillment of the day. And in, in Hebrews 8, and, uh, and, and from, a, from a scripture standpoint, if you all want to read the book of Hebrews, and in particular chapters maybe 5 through 10, uh, I, I think it would it would add to the meetings and just take your time with them. And if you want to look at the whole book of Hebrews, uh, go for it, because it's it's uh, paramount to what we're studying in Hebrews eight. Again, it says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. And we really, really gathered that up last week of, of the order of Melchizedek. Uh, but, but here's the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that, that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So this word sum means of the head, the main point, the chief matter, a sum of money. And, and what I, I kind of heard in my heart as I was reading this was, was a measurement. And then such, the word such, we have such a high priest of the things we've spoken, this is the sum, we have such a high priest, and that means of this sort. And, and again, if you go back into uh, Hebrews 7, it'll give you the sort and the son of the Melchizedek priesthood. And uh, if you weren't here last week, I can send you that. But, but he's the summation of that priesthood. He's in the order of an endless life. And he's forever, forever a priest. So he's the minister of the sanctuary. And I, and I know we that are on this call have understood this to a measure for years. You are the temple of the living God. You are the temple of the living God. So Christ is the minister of you. You're the sanctuary he's the minister of. Okay? In 2 Corinthians 6.14, 2 Corinthians 6.14, the the Bible reads, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? 
And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now we read that, and we've had a understanding of that for many, many years. But what I hear the Lord saying in my heart is the measurement of the temple is according to the high priest. That's what I hear inside. That that's the measurement of the temple that you and I are. So when we say he, he lives in us and he walks in us, just like he said, he lives in us and walks in us according to, to our high priest, according to our high priest. So there's been a reality in our hearts for years that God is in us, that Christ has come and he dwells in his church. And, and it's been proclaimed in groups of believers for a long time that Christ has come and he's dwelling in you, but then how is he dwelling in you? See, see, that's that's really how the Lord's dealing with me. He's the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So he so how he dwells in us is according to his ministry. And if I don't understand his ministry, I'm not I'm probably not walking in the fullness of what's available to me as a believer. That's, that's, why, that's why we're in this ongoing walk of knowing the Lord. It's an ongoing walk of knowing the Lord because it's in the knowing of the Lord is how God dwells in us. Now, he's in us, right? God is in us. But the knowing of how he's in us and us living in the reality of of how he's in us is through measurements of Christ. It's through measurements of Christ. And, and, we, and we talked about this uh, a couple weeks or so ago, how that every article of the of furniture was, uh, was absolutely precise. It was built exact. And it had to be exact because it was the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament tabernacle, the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it had to be perfect. It couldn't be off one bit to even be the testimony of him. Because it was speaking of perfection. It was speaking of a complete work. And so, so the way God lives in us is according to that complete work. It's according to Christ. It's according to the death, burial, and resurrection, outer, inner, most holy place. You have of Jesus Christ. So when we begin to look at the day of atonement, and the word atonement, if you look it up, means a covering. That's what it means, a covering. So when I look and think on that, I, I wrote this note, atonement means to cover, and I wrote what a covering we have. We are covered with all he has done. We are clothed upon with Christ. That's what Paul said in one place. 
We are clothed upon with Christ. He is our atonement. He is our covering. All that was in the mercy seat is covered by him. The law, the prophets, and Psalms wrapped up in him. So, so when, I, when I look and try to understand my atonement, I have to see the person that fulfilled it. It's, it's the same way when I come to the, to the brazen altar, when I come to the door of the, of the temple, Jesus said, I'm, I am the door to the sheepfold. So as soon as we walk through the door, if we set up the temple in our hearts for a moment and we walk through the door or the gate of the temple, we are met immediately with a brazen altar. Immediately. And, it, and that altar, you know, <laughs> what, what is it? Five sacrifices are offered upon that altar altar, not just the sacrifice for sin. And then on the day of atonement, there are, I believe, three, four, five, you can read it in the book of Leviticus, offered there. You know, Aaron offers for himself. Aaron offers for the people. So, so you have uh, you have the multiple offerings that are up on that altar. And I said three, four, five. Uh, I, I can't remember how many it is. It may be just three, but there's multiples of offerings that are offered up on that altar. Jesus Christ fulfilled them all. So he, he just did not fulfill the sin offer. He fulfilled all offerings with one offering. He fulfilled the entire sacrificial system. Never again will there, there be a need for sacrifice. Never again. But what there's a need of is for you and I to comprehend that altar in the person of Jesus Christ. So, so when I begin to look at the Day of Atonement and the High Priest, everything gets summed up in our High Priest. So there's nothing missing and there's nothing lacking. God finished the work in Christ and entered into his rest. And we comprehend the finished work of the Lord and live or walk according to that work. We're the tabernacle of that work. That's, that's what you're the tabernacle of. Christ as a son over his own house. Well, he's the priest of his house, whose house you are. So Christ is a son over his own house, whose house you are. So as the priest of that house, that house is established upon his work. That's what the house is established upon, is upon the work of the high priest. That's what your salvation is established upon. So if I, if I have a very limited understanding of the work of the high priest, I have a very limited understanding of my salvation then, right? Because I don't, I don't understand my high priest. I was, I was looking at things last night, and I, and I think I was thinking on Mount Zion. And we talk about it's the high fall. And it, and it just dawned on me how that even in the natural, people look at high education. 
So, so we, we are brought into the highest education of any group of people in the world. We are. We, we're brought to the mind of Christ. Now, you can't come to a higher thought than the mind of Christ. So we're built out of the work of the high priest as his house. We're the embodiment of it. So we're the embodiment of what he's done. That's, that's what we are. The church, which is his body. The fullness of him that fills all and in all. And he's filling us in the work he has done. That's how he's filling our hearts and our minds. That's what the Holy Ghost is doing. It is showing us the work Christ has done in the person of Christ. So, so, it, so the work that's being shown in our hearts is not just that Jesus died on a cross, not just that Jesus was buried, not just that he raised from the dead as something that's far away from us, but the work that's being done is a joining of you and I to what he did. That's, that's the work that's being done. That's, that's why the Spirit of God keeps moving us uh, over and over and over again in death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we can't seem to ever get out of the, of the death part of it, because the death part of it is working in him. It's, <laughs> I am he that liveth and was dead. In the book of Revelation, he brings that into view. I am he that liveth and was dead. He could have just said, I am he that liveth and liveth and liveth and liveth, because he does. But he makes an emphasis of himself that I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and hell. So, so he brings into view that he died. You go, you go to the throne in Revelation chapter 5. And John sees a lamb standing, which would, which would, to me, denote he's in authority. He's risen. He's standing, maybe denoting his strength and power. But he, but he describes him as a lamb that have been slain. So in the view that John sees of the lamb, the standing lamb, the authority and power is in view of one that had been slain and all the victory that the death worked. So, so when I come into looking at the day of atonement, and, I, and ultimately, he enters into the presence of God. He enters into the presence of God with blood. So he enters into the presence of God with what the blood speaks. The death speaks. In, in Hebrews 12, it says the blood of Jesus speaks greater than that of Abel. So, so, so our high priest had to enter in with blood. So he had to fulfill 
the, what the priesthood was declaring. And he had to enter into the presence of God with blood. And he did with his own blood, with his own death. And that's what John brings into view. He saw a lamb that had been slain, having the seven spirits of God, having the fullness of God in the throne. So, so, so here, all of this is in relationship to you and I. Everything that he did comes to a relationship to you and I because we're the tabernacle of his glory. My Lord, if we hear that, we are the tabernacle of his glory. I mean, we can get excited all day that we're the tabernacle, and that's great, and that's a, that's a great place to come to, and, and all of God's people need to come there, that God's not building another house in the Middle East. He doesn't need one. God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. He's not worshiped with man's hands. That, and, and to me, that doesn't mean you don't raise your hands and praise God. That, that's big monasteries, big, big buildings being uh, built by man doesn't show praise unto the Lord. But God built a house to dwell in, to fill it with his glory. And, and, it's, a, and it's a great thing to come and realize you're the house of God. You're the house of God and declare that to folks that you're the house of God. But it's a greater thing to realize what the house of God is filled with. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. It is filled with the work of the high priest. That's what it's filled with. That's what it's filled with. It's filled with the substance of Christ. So, so you're talking about image bearers. You know, we, we use that term, we're image bearers. You better believe it because his substance is filling us to bear him in the earth. In, in Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, it says, uh, I'm looking, which, I'll start at verse 8. You, we, we read, I believe, most of this last week, but I'm going to read verse 8 down through some verses. But it says, which was a figure for the time then present. Now, what a figure was, was the old temple, the two parts of the old tabernacle with the veil was a figure. We don't have a veil in our tabernacle. So that was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. So even the high priest himself couldn't be perfect. Couldn't make him perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So if the high priest couldn't be made perfect as pertaining to the conscience, how could the people? And it goes on and says, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on, on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. 
neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered him once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who, it, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So, so the blood of Christ purges the conscience from dead works. Now you say, well, what are dead works? You, you could say, well, they're the works that were under the law. The carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of reformation because those works could never perfect the comers to it. So people that come even in understanding to the law Here, the ceremonial, this would be represent the ceremonial law, the, the, the offering of the gifts and the sacrifices, the work of the high priest. They can never be perfect. So it was imposed upon them to a time of reformation. So if I, don't, if I won't come out of this understanding of the old, if I refuse to come out of this understanding, I even though Jesus has purged us, I won't walk in the reality of a purged conscience. Why won't I do that? If I've received the Lord, why won't I do that? Because I won't come out of the old. See, see if, I, if I walk around in the understanding of the old, the understanding of the old left you incomplete. You know, you were never allowed into the presence of God. And if you listen to many believers talk, they talk about the presence of God only in the mind that every now and then, God comes down in their midst in a service. I used to walk there myself. And not in the reality that he dwells in me. That the habitation of the Lord is the church. This is where he chose to dwell. But he dwells in me according to the person of Jesus Christ. And, and in the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus prayed, Father, glorify me with thine own self. So there's a realization in our hearts to be had of the self of God. That's correct. Jesus prayed that. He said, he, he's our great high priest, right? So, so he didn't take a censer with smoke on it. You know, in the, in the book of Revelation, I believe it says it, 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 that the censer represents the prayers of the saints. So Jesus didn't take a censer with smoke on it. He prayed the prayer of the high priest Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory that I have with thee before the world would watch. And goes on that I might be glorified in them. And goes on and says that they may be one as we are one and that they may behold my glory. To be changed to the same image by beholding the glory of the Lord. Now that's how we're changed. 
and transform and renew is by beholding the glory, by beholding the splendor of Christ, by understanding the length, the depth, the breadth, and the height of the love of God. And the love of God was, was poured out at the cross. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So, so we, when we come here, that's what's before us. That's the habitation of God that we are, is of his glory. That's, that's what the, the, the temple and tabernacle represented was the place that God's glory dwelled. Not just that God dwells here. Yes, he does. But he dwells here in his magnificent person. And who he is is made known to us. And, it, it, and, and you know, I, I'll throw this out here. Why we have to know the death is because the nature of God is not in the old man. It ain't in him at all. So, so that nature, that mind, that whole thought of the old man had to be crucified because it's not in God. And God is bringing us into what he is. So it had to be taken away, had to be buried because it's not, not only is it not in him, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. So God doesn't even accept it. I, I hear brothers teaching that somehow the old man's acceptable. And I go, oh, no, brother. That's why the cross is there. And, and all that's going to do is bring more confusion into the body of Christ because the old man was cut off. He was crucified and buried and put away. That's why there was a burnt offering. That's why it had to be totally consumed. It had to be totally done away with. That's why, that's why we say ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And Jesus had to go into the grave because the old man was completely being removed. And so our life is in the risen Christ. It's not in the old man. It's not in Adam. It's not finding something that was back there in Adam that God had to have. It's finding our life in Christ. That's what Paul says, to be found in him. Paul's whole pursuit became that I might know him. And, and his ministry, Brother Dale and I were talking about it today, and, and maybe yesterday we talked a little while, was that I've determined to know nothing among you, say Jesus Christ and him crucified, that the substance that we come into would be him. Honey, if I give you the substance of Wayne, it won't be very good. Just won't. But if we come to know the substance of Christ together, it'll be fantastic. I tell you, just, just seeing the measurement of this thing, I almost didn't but well, it get as much said as maybe I wanted to, but just seeing the measurement, just, just a couple of scriptures and we'll be done. In Zechariah 1, 16, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. I mean, oh, what the mercies of the Lord that's in Christ. If we understand the mercies of God that's in Christ, my house shall be built in it. So his house is built in mercies, saith the Lord of hosts. 
and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. A measuring line. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Now there's, there's a measurement. The Lord shall comfort Zion. So my comfort is the Lord. That's a pretty... Great comfort. God himself shall comfort us. You've come to Mount Zion. So, so the measurement of the house that's built there, the line that is stretched forth upon Jerusalem, is Christ, is the measure of this high priest, is all that he's fulfilled. Ezekiel 40. Ezekiel 40 verse 5 says, And behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about, and in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and a handbreadth. So he measured the breadth of the building. He measured the breadth of the building. Christ as a son over his own house, whose house you are. He measured the building, one reed and the height, one reed. That's, and we can go on and on. I, I, I just read you a couple of scriptures, but there's other scriptures that deal with the measurement. And like I said, the furniture, the perfect measure of the furniture, speaking of the complete offering of Christ. And as we look at this high priest, we have to take into consideration, I mentioned the burnt offering, but we, 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 Anita sings a song, he is our peace. There is no peace till the Prince of Peace has come. Well, well that peace offering that was in Israel, the carnal mind is enmity with God, right? We, we've read that in our Bible, the carnal mind is enmity with God. Jesus took away the carnal mind. He destroyed the old man and his mind and gave you the mind of Christ that you may know the things of God. Because the natural man knows the things of man, Paul says. So we're spiritually minded people. Because the mind of Christ, the word of God, is living and operating in us and showing himself to us. So we have his mind, we have his word, we have his thought, we have his reasoning operating in our souls. And it's showing us who he is, it's showing us his work. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. He's broken down the middle wall. Took Jew and Gentile in the body of his flesh and crucified him. And brought forth one new man. I probably shouldn't say this, but when I hear people say, well, we're Judea Christian believers, I want to say, you might be, but I'm not. <laughs> I was going to say it kind of harder than that, but... <laughs> But we're not Judea Christian believers. We're believers in Christ. We're the body of Christ. Judaism, as well as Gentilism, both were crucified. The law served its purpose. The law was holy and good, but it come to its conclusion in the person of Jesus Christ and he is our righteousness, and he presents us holy, righteous, and pure in himself. So we're the habitation of him that is holy. Be ye holy, he said, 
as I am holy. Well, I don't know how we could get to that any greater than him living in me, except by knowing the measurement of his holiness. Knowing the measure of his righteousness. What I mean is comprehending that. Understanding what that means in, in our heart and living in it. That's what Brother Jim uses, not I, but Christ. That's what he's talking about. Not, not I, but I'm apprehending that of Christ. That's, that's to me, that's the walk by faith. I, I, I believe God for things. I, I do. I, I do in, in natural things. I believe God for things, but the walk by faith that I'm seeing is apprehending that of Christ, is getting a hold of what he's done and living in it. Living in it, manifesting it in their earth. And that's what he's presented to us, is, is he's our high priest. See, see, Israel lived in, just one more moment, but Israel lived in what their high priest did. You realize that? They lived in what he did. That was, that, their, their society revolved around their high priest. It, it revolved around the temple and the high priest of that temple, and they lived in the reality of what their high priest did. You know, that he would take the blood in there, and one time a year it would be accepted by God, if it was accepted. And they would have a cleansing of the flesh, but not of the conscience. Not to enter into the presence of God. Not to be made pure, not to be made holy, not to be made complete. But see, we have now a greater high priest and greater promises that you are complete in him. That as he is, so are you. Now that's quite a promise to get a hold of. And the one that, you, you know, promised it is also the one that gives it. He couldn't promise by any greater, Hebrews said, so he promised by himself. He did the work himself. God couldn't choose any greater one. So he did it himself. And now he is the rewarder. He rewards. We, we could come to a greater rewarder than God, could we? He rewards those that what? Diligently seek him. And then he told Abraham, just to, just to kind of think on this, I am thy exceeding great reward. So what's he rewarding us with but the substance of himself that we can walk in? Be the manifestation of it in the earth. Be the habitation, the tabernacle of it. Amen, amen, amen. Now that's what kind of tabernacle we are. And uh, we'll see where this goes in the next few weeks. Um, I, just, I just am absolutely loving this study. It's ministering to my heart, to my mind. And I pray it is to yours. So I'm just going to stop right here uh, and call on Brother uh, Jim Wickens. I think Brother Jim's in uh, traveling again, but I'm going to call on him. If, he's, if he can answer the phone, if he can't, I understand. <laughs>